everybody. Um, thanks for being interested in fact checking. Um, it's a really important part of the writing and editing process for anywhere you might want to work. Um, and I highly recommend actually doing something in fact checking if you um, eventually want to also be a writer and reporter. Um, so this is the first slide. This is just a tweet um, that I felt like summed up fact checking really well. Um, it's true that fact checkers really are the writer's um, best friend and best resource um, because they should be monitoring um, every single claim <clears throat> and argument that the writer's trying to make and making sure that um, it's soundproof because that's going to make the overall piece better at the end of the day. What qualifies as a fact in a story and um, what does that mean that as a fact checker you would be looking at in every piece? Um, so this is just kind of a graphic to illustrate what the most important things are in a story that you would need to make sure is correct. Um, and then the wider out the ring, um, kind, I don't want to say less important, but it's just not as important as the stuff towards the center of the bullseye. So um, at the very center of the bullseye is libelous stuff, which um, you're going to end up seeing a lot if you're checking pieces that have to do with um, the criminal justice system, uh, any sort of like sexual violence allegations, um, really anything related to like laws and um, crime. Um, the next section is crucial stuff. So crucial stuff can be uh, a lot of different things, but the overall idea is that um, the foundations of the story are sound. And if someone like a fact checker was picking apart the story, um, if too many of the facts and claims the writer is making are um, just completely erroneous, then the whole story is going to fall apart and uh, it probably shouldn't be published at all. So that's why it's um, just right up above from libelous stuff. Um, embarrassing stuff is things that are um, inaccuracies that like not only are should have been pretty easily caught, but kind of um, tend to show a writer or fact checkers blind spots. Um, so they can be things like the example um, is where Honduras is located. And um, these kinds of embarrassing errors pop up a lot because if you constantly only have um, white people, for example, in newsrooms doing the writing and the fact checking and the editing, um, there's probably going to be a lot of things that slip through that um, kind of show that there is not a diversity of thought in that workplace. Um, okay, checkable stuff. It's kind of similar to embarrassing stuff. Um, it's a lot of small little details that are probably pretty easily verifiable that might have just slipped through the cracks. Um, they are definitely still important. All of these things are important, but um, they tend to be things that like if wrong and you have to uh, write a correction for are not going to get you um, in legal trouble, for example, like the libelous or crucial stuff might. Um, and then the outermost ring, murky stuff. Um, so these are errors that um, most people, other than like the writer, editor, and fact checker might not even notice, but they're still important to correct because they can still change slightly the content of what the writer is saying. Um, and I'm gonna go into more details about all of these, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so um, just an example of libelous stuff. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of times, especially since uh, Me Too, um, the types of stories that you'll see that deal with these topics are related to um, criminal allegations, specifically like this example, um, sexual assault or harassment. And um, this is one example of when the fact checking went wrong. It's a very famous 
Rolling Stone article that eventually got retracted because um, the fact checking process fell through. Um, basically, as this paragraph says, um, the central source that was making the allegations was not fact checked adequately. Um, they realized after it was published, there was a lot of holes in the reporting. Um, and this is kind of like the worst case scenario. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate because we do know that like things like sexual assault on college campuses, which is what this story was about. Um, obviously, we all know that that happens. Um, so it's really a shame when fact checking falls through like this because it kind of um, detracts legitimate legitimacy to like real issues. But Unfortunately, the reporting and fact checking was just not up to par with what the story needed. Crucial stuff. Um, so, like I was saying earlier, these are uh, things that are like the main ideas of the story. If they are inconsistent or if the facts from one paragraph to another um, are changing constantly, um, if you can't really tell where the writer is pulling a lot of their claims um, or data or anything like that. Um, that should be a big red flag that the story is just not factually sound. Um, this is one example where, again, fact checking unfortunately um, fell through. This is for New York Magazine. Um, basically, they ran a story that this student um, was making millions of dollars through the stock market. Uh, the student did provide the fact checker um, with a bank statement, but later on it was found that that bank, bank statement was falsified. Um, so this is just an example of um, being really skeptical of the materials and sources that you are looking through while doing a fact check. Um, it's always best to get primary documents and primary sources, which I'll go into in the second presentation. Um, but so for like this example, um, this is kind of would have been a tough one for the fact checker to, to look at because they were given a bank statement. Um, but again, the whole point of fact checking is just like really picking things apart. Um, so they probably should have been a little more skeptical of a bank statement that um, someone was giving them for millions of dollars, especially uh, someone who was a student. Um, and eventually the student also admitted that he might have led the reporter to believe uh, something that was not fully accurate. Um, so again, like this is just an example of the whole main idea of the story was not true so therefore every other thing in the story just like fell apart um yeah okay embarrassing stuff um so these can be things that are anything from misidentifying a source to um like the earlier example i included it here again of where a country is located um these are really things that are pretty easily um, checkable. So that's partly why it can be embarrassing if they're missed. Um, the, the notes I wrote to the side here about double checking things with sources, um, name spellings, titles, job descriptions, pronouns, um, and any other descriptors that the writer used. Um, this is really, really important in this section because um, like I wrote, it's not only embarrassing for you and the writer if someone is misidentified, um, but in some cases it can actually really harm and upset that source if they're misidentified, especially if this is like a sensitive story topic to begin with. Um, so it's super, super important um, to ask sources when you have access to them, all of those things. And um, you really need to be like tough with the writer you're working with on these things to make sure that every single one of those things is um, verifiable. Okay, checkable stuff. Um, so these are just pretty much like cut and dry facts that um, 
you can find pretty easily and shouldn't be that um, tough to, to track down the answers for. Um, so the example I have here is actually something from my own work on a um, magazine piece about state legislatures. Um, so the part highlighted, highlighted in red was the error. Um, basically this writer wrote that um, Amy Steele, which is the Democratic candidate down there, um, came within 1,800 votes of winning. While that was close, if you subtract 18,969 minus 16,991, um, like it says there from Ballotpedia, which is a um, reliable source, um, it actually comes out to, she was short 1,978 votes of winning, um, which is obviously more than what the writer had. Um, and so I think we ended up correcting this sentence to say that Amy came within 2,000 votes of winning because that is technically um, within a different, a more accurate range. Um, this is just another example. This is from the same story as the previous example. Um, so this writer was just talking about partisan control of state legislatures over time. Um, and 2009 and 2017, um, so you can see this is, these sources are where I pulled um, this information from. Both of these charts were from the National Conference of State Legislatures, which is, again, a, a pretty reliable source um, for this type of thing. They have everything tracked by year. Um, so it was super easy to just look this up. And um, as you can see, all of the numbers in these two sentences were wrong. Um, so that would have been really bad if that went through because it completely changes the, um, the message of those sentences. Okay, uh, murky stuff. Um, yeah, so like I said earlier, these are things that um, they might sound really, really like nitpicky to you or the other the writer that you're bringing it up to, but that is that is your job is to be super super nitpicky and look at everything with a um, magnifying glass. So, and so these are things that write uh, readers might not always um, catch, but they are still important. Um, so the example I had here was another thing from one of my own checks. Um, this writer was talking about Amazon. Um, warehouse workers during um, COVID and how they were not given um, labor protections or health protections. Um, and this writer wrote, these workers are often young, which, um, you know, after researching that a lot, looking at multiple, multiple news reports, other stories that were talking about this, um, it was pretty clear that Amazon warehouse workers um, span in ages, like I circled there. Um, I didn't think it was accurate to say that most or often they are young. Um, so I brought that up to the writer, as you can see, and um, the writer, um, yeah, said that when she wrote, the workers are often young, that was coming from her own anecdotes that she had heard, which um, I'm glad I brought it up because that, you know, anecdotes are not um, the best way to verify things, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think we just ended up changing that sentence to, uh, like I wrote there, we softened the language, language to those workers are um, sometimes young or sometimes younger or something like that. Okay, so um, I just wanted to end on this slide for the basics of fact checking, um, just because I wanted to point out this um, person's sentence that um, a good fact checker is an annoying fact checker. Um, it's really, really true. It's just kind of like when you're doing reporting yourself or writing yourself. Um, if you're trying to get answers and especially if this is a type of story that's like an accountability story or you're you're talking about sensitive things um if you need to press people press people um 
and your writer should be thankful that you bring up a lot of um, issues that you might find with them because it's at the end of the day going to make their piece a lot better because it's going to make it a lot more solid and um, you want a piece to be as factually sound as possible um, so that when readers are looking at the piece they can actually focus on the reporting and the writer's message and not constantly getting caught up in errors that they might be seeing. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of like a reminder to if you're ever fact checking, don't be worried about um, bothering the writer that you're working with too much or anything like that because it's your job to, um, to pick apart their work essentially. So yeah, um, okay, that's the end of this first presentation. I hope it was helpful and I'll go into the next one soon. Thanks everyone.